Our scripture lesson this morning is from Nehemiah chapter 2. We'll be looking at a couple of other places, but chapter 2, beginning in verse 6 and reading through the end of the chapter. This is where we left off three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Nehemiah 2, verse 6. Then the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, How long will your journey be? And when you, will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me from the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me the timber to make beams for the gates and of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house in which I will go. And the king granted them to me, because the good hand of my God was upon me. And then I came to the governors of the provinces beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. And now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite the official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem, and there was no animal with me except the animal which I was riding. So when I went out by night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on to the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were consumed by fire, then I passed on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no place for my mount to pass. So I went up at night by the ravine and inspected the wall, and then I entered the valley gate again and returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests and the nobles, the officials or the rest who did the work. And then I said to them, you see the bad situation that we're in, that Jerusalem is desolate, and its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be in reproach. And I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me, and all about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to do the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against your king? So I answered and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore we are his servants and will arise and build but you have no portion or right in the memorial of Jerusalem. Let's pray. We thank you, our God, for this story of Nehemiah in the vision and the counsel that you gave him in this work. We pray, Lord, that as we look into this passage of Scripture again in this story, you will give us understanding and cause us to think more about our work for you. Bless our time and bless this word as we learn together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. visitor 
I got uh, re-interested in studying Nehemiah about a month ago, and it was poor planning on my part that uh, we did a lesson on Nehemiah or a sermon, thought about it, and I wanted to continue a couple of more weeks, but we had Mother's Day, Ascension Sunday, and Pentecost Sunday, and I wanted to give proper due to those weeks, but I'd, I'd like us to return to Nehemiah. I confess to you that I don't sometimes uh, delve into the Old Testament as much as I should. It seems easier to deal with New Testament stories and characters, the apostles and Paul, and certainly the words of Jesus and the Gospels, but uh, perhaps we should look more often at some of the Old Testament stories and I was privileged probably 12, 13 years ago when Nancy and I were attending another church to be teaching a men's Sunday school class and come on a lesson about Nehemiah. And I've been uh, intrigued by it, so to speak, ever since, and I revisit it from time to time. But we, uh, we had talked about Nehemiah a little bit a month ago room to set the stage in the background uh, in the books of Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah we see the story of uh, the temple being rebuilt and now Nehemiah being rebuilding the wall after the exiles have returned uh, from the Babylonian captivity and we find Nehemiah sitting in the Persian king's palace and home and being his cupbearer. So Zerubbabel had returned with about 50,000 exiles to Jerusalem some 25 or 30 years earlier, approximately 475, 480 BC. And now Nehemiah comes on the scene and we see the story of Nehemiah. The temple had been rebuilt, so for Israel, the center of spiritual life was always the temple, and that was the first priority. And Zerubbabel and the exiles had gotten that accomplished. However, we see in Nehemiah, the walls were broken down, the gates had been burned, there was the lack of physical protection from animals and storms and other warring people so the people in Jerusalem the exiles could be easily attacked so we see that this was a physical a matter of their physical well-being but it's also a symbol of the spiritual return to them so the walls needed to be rebuilt in Jerusalem because the people all around them saw the exiles come back into the city of Jerusalem, but they came as a defeated people and until the walls were rebuilt. So we see in chapter 1, verse 4, that Nehemiah's heart was broken. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, for I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. First thing we notice in chapter 1, is that Nehemiah had a real burden for those people. Uh, we should have a real burden for all around us in our neighborhood, the people we work with, the people we associate with, family members, anybody does, doesn't know the Lord Jesus is their Savior. These people Nehemiah was burdened for because they had lost their spiritual sense of grounding. 
God gave Nehemiah a burden for the people and a vision for the people. So we see, first of all, Nehemiah approaches God and he says in verse 5, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant with loving kindness to those who keep his commandments. But then Nehemiah admits he confesses both for himself and behalf of the people that they had not keeping their covenant with God. They had rejected the words of God and the teachings, and they had turned away from God. So now it is time to turn back to God. And Nehemiah says in verse 6, Let your ear now be attentive, and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you. You now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servant. So Nehemiah is praying for the people, and he's extensively asking God to care for them, lift them back up spiritually, and let them return to the ways of God. And Nehemiah had a vision to do that. So we saw in our story from a few weeks ago that God had prepared the way for Nehemiah in two ways. One, because he was in the palace already, and he was the cupbearer of the king, an influential position, and he had caught the king's eye. He had evidently been a faithful servant and done everything that he possibly could for the king. And so he had caught the king's eye, but uh, Nehemiah had another thing going for him. We remember in verse 6, the queen was sitting beside the king, and the queen was Esther. A Jewish maiden who was an attractive woman, I guess, and the king Antaxerxes had um, noticed her and claimed her to be his queen. And so she was by the king's side, and God had blessed the situation doubly because Nehemiah was a cupbearer and also because the, the queen was a Jewish maiden who had in mind to help her brothers and sisters, the Jewish people. So that's where we left off a few weeks ago. Now we see Nehemiah had a plan. Not only did he ask to be relieved and to go to Judah, Judah he knew what he needed. So in verse 7 and 8 and 9, we see that the first thing he asked for are letters of authorization. He needed to cross other people's lands, and so, if it please the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the provinces before the river. All of these people had different ways of doing things, and maybe some had treaties and others didn't, but Nehemiah was asking to encroach upon their, their lands and to go for it. Also, he asked in verse 8, and send a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, so that he may give me timber to complete the beams of the gate. So he knew this. So Nehemiah had made plans, he had gotten authorization, and he had gotten the supplies that he needed. Um, then we see finally in verse 10 as he begins his journey and makes his journey across these lands, we see that there's opposition. And there's almost, almost always opposition when we attempt to do the work of the Lord. In this case, sometimes the opposition is just Satan getting our way and Satan using his powers and and what he can do to dissuade people from helping us or joining us. In this case, it was other peoples in the city of Jerusalem, Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and when they heard about it, they, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. And just as an aside, we've seen 
from ancient biblical history, from the time of Isaac and Ishmael, there's always been discord between the Israelites and the neighboring peoples. And people wonder why there can't be lasting peace in the Middle East. It's, it's always been that way. And until Jesus comes back again, I'm afraid it's always going to be that way. And so these peoples, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah, and it mentions another person later down, these people were all against what Nehemiah was doing. But nonetheless, Nehemiah uh, persisted with the plan that he had. So Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, and he spent three days there, evidently looking over the situation, understanding what needed to be done, probably examining the walls in the daytime. But then he says in verse 13, Nehemiah needs to go out on a recon mission. He needs to see what's going on at night and look at all the, examine all the places without someone looking over his shoulder and saying, what are you doing and how is this going to work? What's going on? He didn't want to reveal his plan that God had put in his heart yet. So he goes out at night. I went out by night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on the refuge gate inspecting the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and the gates which were consumed by fire. And skip down to verse 16. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor what as yet I had told the Jews, the priests, and the nobles, the officials, the rest uh, who did the work. So he didn't reveal his whole plan until he had done his recon mission and inspected all the walls and all the gates so that he would have a better idea what this project was going to entail. So now finally in verse 17, he speaks to the people and he says, we have a bad situation here. You see that we have a bad situation, a bad situation we're in. Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls. Let us arise and build so they put their hands to the good work. So, Nehemiah was a good salesman. I presume he was a good cheerleader too. He promoted this project to the people. And as they heard him get excited about the work of rebuilding the walls, they were willing to join in. But notice again, and we'll see these guys another time, but in verse 19, the people uh, that had given him trouble initially, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official <coughs> and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against your king? So, as sometimes we've seen in the New Testament, and sometimes we still see today, when you start doing a work for the Lord, and people will question you, they'll say, are you Christians going against the government or going against the king? You Christians can't really accomplish what you want to do or what you say you're going to do. We're mocked. There's always going to be enemies of the church and enemies of the Lord Jesus who will mock us and make light of the work we're doing. But listen to Nehemiah in verse 20. So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Nehemiah knew where his success came from. And he was probably somewhat ahead of his time, but if you look with me in the book of Philippians, two, just two verses in Philippians that Paul wrote into that church, and this is what Nehemiah understood some 500 years earlier. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. And then in verse 19, 
Paul writing to the Philippian church. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. Nehemiah understood these things long before the Apostle Paul wrote them in the New Testament. So Nehemiah confronts his enemies and he rallies the truth, so to speak, and he says to all those who would oppose him, my God will give us success. When you're feeling down and discouraged about things in your life, or about where our church is headed, or what we can or cannot do, remember this, whatever God wants to accomplish, God will accomplish his purposes and he will give us success. At the present time, I'm thinking and questioning, wondering why God has given us so many assets in terms of finances, gifts from different bequests and different people, and he's still doing it. Sister Chloe left us a gift that we're processing now. And we have all the assets and all the, the cash we need to do much for the Lord in our community. And yet our physical resources, the number of people we have, and the fact that some of you are older than me and I'm getting to where I can't physically do very much, it seems like we're just not able to accomplish all the things that we want to do for the Lord. And that bothers me. And I question why God has provided us with so much in terms of financial and different kinds of assets that are available for us to do the work in this beautiful building that we remodeled and all that we're able to do. And yet we don't have the numerical and the physical resources. Nehemiah was faced with those kind of odds. The people were busy with their own lives and doing things. Nehemiah needed to rally the troops. And so we see at the end of chapter 2, he gives a speech and he tells the, the people that are listening and the opposition, the God of heaven will give us success. And there were, therefore his servants will arise and build. But you folks who are complaining and uh, discouraging us will have no portion or right in the mo memorial to Jerusalem. And then in chapter 3, and I won't take time or um, probably try to pronounce all of these names, but if you look at the entirety of chapter 3, it talks about the different family groups and the different people who repaired the different gates. The sheep gate in verse 1. Next to him the men of Jericho built and the men of Zachar, the son of Emery, built. And it goes all down through the chapter. And each family and each person took their station and rebuilt part of the wall. So you see it was a team effort. Nehemiah rallied the people together and he got them to begin work on the wall, to begin the work, and God blessed their efforts. And we found out later on, in 52 days, they got it all done. The walls of the temple were rebuilt so there would be no more shame on Israel. The people of Israel, the children of Israel, were back. God had brought the exiles back to Jerusalem. Now he had envisioned, given Nehemiah the vision to do something about the wall and to rebuild it. And he had given the people a vision so that they would begin the work of rebuilding the wall. Next week, I want us to look at chapter 4 of Nehemiah. And it's a story of uh, the work completed the work ridiculed, disappointment overcome, but they get the work done and they finish the project. Ask yourself what you can do to be a part of God's work, both in your personal life and in the life of this church.
what we can do to uh, reach our community for Christ. I pray that uh, God will give you a vision and that we will be able to accomplish this together. Amen.